From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Welcome to this Cube Conversation. I'm Paul Gillen, Enterprise Editor at SiliconANGLE. We've been talking a lot about cloud native on SiliconANGLE lately, and uh, my guest is someone who had a seminal role in defining the uh, the principal architecture, some of the fo foundational technologies for cloud native uh, applications. Ben Golub is the CEO of Storage, a company that has a really interesting new approach to storage management that we'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, ben is probably best known to many people as the uh, former CEO of Docker, which pioneered software containers and was one of the fastest growing companies in Silicon Valley history. Uh, ben, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate your being here today. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. So uh, let's get into the question of cloud native. It's a, a theme that we're focusing mm -hmm. on right now. How important is it for organizations you believe that are moving to the cloud to choose to re-architect around cloud native principles? Uh, well, I, I think it's, it's, I mean, two points. First of all, I, I think that the cloud native is sort of a spectrum. And uh, for many people, there is a point along the spectrum that makes sense. You know, at the far end of the spectrum is uh, applications that are you know, deployed on a massive scale. They're composed of thousands of microservices, you know, heavily orchestrated with things like Kubernetes, scaling up, scaling down. And for many organizations, they don't need to go all the way there to get real benefits. Um, and maybe the related thing is that I think for organizations, there's absolutely, uh, for almost all organizations, there's value in moving along that spectrum, but they should be thoughtful about where it is that they're going and why they're going. Either or thing, they, 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 applications can live along a spectrum. Uh, you submitted some comments recently for an article we did on this topic, and, and, and among them you said that uh, some applications may make sense being containerized or docker, dockerized, but not being orchestrated with Kubernetes. Well, can right. you give an example of, of something that meets that criteria? Sure. Well, again, I, I think that um, almost all applications can benefit from running on more cloud-like infrastructure. There's certainly value in having infrastructure that that scales up or sorry, uh, scale, scales up that scales out um, uh, that uh, where people can be able to sort of dynamically use resources and not have it have to rely on big iron um, um, but in terms of the applications themselves applications uh, traditional applications can run well in uh, cloudy environments provided that some steps are taken and often for many organizations the first step with a traditional application is simply to containerize it or dockerize it um, that gives a lot of benefits, including, you know, uh, ease of migration, um, greater ease of adopting things like CI, CD. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to take all of your traditional applications, break them into lots of microservices, start orchestrating them with Kubernetes on day one. For some applications, it may never make sense because they're not going to be, you know, run at massive scale. Uh, many people assume that containers and cloud native architecture are inextricably linked. Is, is that your opinion? Uh, well, so I, I think that um, uh, cloudy infrastructure uh, uh, tends to benefit from, from containerization. Um, but really, it's more of an application question. If you are breaking your application or your, or your writing applications that are composed of lots of different services, um, Almost inevitably, you want to have those services in containers so that they have clean interfaces between them. Um, and so that uh, you can do the things people want to do with cloud native, which is um, you know, make changes to you know, microservice A with a small team and do so rapidly without unintentionally screwing up microservice B, C, D, et cetera. And the uh, dockerization, containerization, among other things, provides that nice clean interface. Uh, how have you seen, I mean, since you left Docker three years ago, how have you seen the container technology evolve? What do you think are some of the most important evolutions we've seen in container technology since then? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, what has been really important, of course, is to see that the community continues to grow. So, of course, the Docker community continues to grow. Um, uh, there are now lots of other communities around it, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, Kubernetes. And I think what you're seeing is um, really the maturing of this technology so that um, applications can be written uh, uh, in a cloud native way much more, more easily. The barriers to making an application cloud native really come down, but also the potential for running uh, applications at, at really massive scale uh, have, have, have increased. And there's certainly a number of interesting things that have happened in the storage space in terms of persistent volumes. Uh, things that have happened in terms of um, serverless technology, service meshes, 
meshes uh, like Istio. And these are all really great examples of how the community is, is filling in uh, around containers. We've heard a lot about the benefits of portability that come from using mm -hmm. containers, uh, but being portable can involve some trade-offs because you have to give up some of the native functionality of branded cloud platforms. Do you think sure. that the goal of multi-cloud is overblown? Um, I, I, I think there is real value in being multi-cloud, um, and I think I think that um, while um, you know the the larger cloud providers have have provided great services. You know, they, it is in their nature, of course, to try and, and have all of the workloads run within their, within their, their four walls. Um, and uh, I think for most organizations, um, you know, lock-in is a bad idea regardless, right? Um, you know, we're in a distributed world. Most people want to be able to run their applications uh, at scale in a distributed way, and they want to be able to, um, you know, take advantage of spare cycles and, and the most efficient way and, uh, and cost-effective way of doing so. And, and so having lock-in, I, I uh, I think is a bad idea, and for most organizations, the investment to become portable, you know, while not trivial, uh, pays off in the long run. How about some of the cultural issues? This is something that you also mentioned in the the right. uh, comments you contributed to us earlier. Uh, we hear often that the biggest impediments are not technical or even skills, yeah. but actually changing the culture to adapt to a cloud native way of building applications. Uh, how should organizations prepare for that shift? Um, well, I mean, I, I think I think that they should uh, recognize what those differences are going to be. And if you're writing, you know, the traditional method was you write a, a large monolithic application um, because it's so big and complicated. Generally speaking, people follow a uh, sort of a waterfall procedure. They have large teams working on it, and you know, you update the application once or twice a year uh, at the high end. Um, the Cloud native approach is let's write uh, applications that are composed of lots of smaller services uh, produced by smaller teams that move very rapidly, and a lot of the testing and the deployment happens in a very automated way. Um, and the cultural barriers are, are are pretty large, right? I think most people are happy at the end of the journey, but there's a period in between where things are difficult, and that you're you know you're breaking glass as it will. And so I think for for a lot of large organizations, the approach that often works best is to have a uh, a few um, sort of isolated greenfield application um, approaches where you have a small team that is sort of proving out and becoming good uh, ambassadors for doing things in a cloud native way. But there's also a, an evolutionary way to bring the older applications along that for many organizations is really helpful. Uh, that doesn't sort of have you running head on into, into the cultural issues with the traditional application. So break them up into teams and have different teams at different stages of evolution. Right, right. And so I think you can have a, a small advanced team that is that is working on new applications that are greenfield and building them in a cloud native way. Um, but then the sort of transition path for the teams that are working on the older applications, traditional applications that were not initially architected in a cloud native way, is to break them down in an evolutionary way. First, dockerize or containerize the traditional applications, then maybe break them down from a monolith into so say three tiers, each of those tiers being containerized, uh, and then potentially pull out one of those services if it's a common service across all of the applications and start using that. And, and the process, I think we find organizations uh, get the sort of muscle memory around doing things in a more uh, continuous way, in a more agile way, uh, and they get experience with tools like CI, CD, Docker, uh, Kubernetes, et cetera, in a, in a more organic way. Do you find that people who come from the traditional waterfall development background eventually can make that shift? I think some can. Um, you know, there, 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 there are pluses and minuses, but um, I think that most organizations find that as they get more agile, um, uh, things that used to be very difficult become a lot easier, right? So, so rather than having big masses of code that need to be uh, rewritten and you change uh, you change something in one area and it breaks things in an unexpected way in another area, right? And, and you're trying to get large teams of people to sort of agree on things, which we know is not the way the world works. Um, uh, when you get to smaller teams working on more atomic pieces of the code with clean interfaces between them and can iterate more rapidly without having unintended consequences, for most organizations that not only makes them 
faster, but it gives higher quote quality, safer, et cetera. Uh, another topic we hear a lot about today is application modernization. What does that mean right. to you? Um, so I think for me, application modernization means that you are re-architect, you're, you're, you're making the application itself more, more cloud-like, um, which doesn't mean that you make it full-scale cloud-native on day one, right? But that you, uh, for example, taking an, a, a traditional application and dockerizing it or containerizing it, just containerizing the monolith actually gives some real, real advantages. Um, uh, and that then sets people up to say, let's not only take the advantages that we now have in terms of portability, but let's start exploring the advantages that we can get from having more frequent deployments or uh, more automated testing. Um, and so really it, it's it's modernizing the application, but also modernizing the environment around it and the culture for how you build and deploy applications. Uh, let's turn to your current venture, Storage. You've been sure. the CEO there for about two and a half years now. A very interesting yeah. decentralized approach to storage using blockchain. Uh, just tell us quickly how you're reimagining storage. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, for uh, for of course, most of, uh, of computing history, storage was done uh, by people buying their own disk drives and then storing data on it. And if they failed or got lost, that was a problem. Uh, or if they had to buy too much, that was expensive. Then we moved to centralized clouds where you were storing data on drives that one organization was running. We've sort of taken it a step further where we built a, uh, a storage service, um, but we don't run or own any disk drives. We're, we're sort of like Airbnb for disk drives, right? But we've, we've uh, gotten tens of thousands of people around the globe, uh, generally data centers who have spare capacity, enable them to rent out that spare capacity. And we're offering our customers a way to do storage that is much safer uh, much more private, faster, and far less expensive uh, than with the traditional clouds. Uh, certainly, intuitively, it would be less expensive. How is it faster? Uh, well, it, it's 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 faster for a lot of the same reasons that uh, you know the the internet, if you will, is faster than uh, than traditional uh, you know the traditional approach towards landlines. Right? We we were able to to take advantage of parallelism. Right. So we break every file up into a large number of pieces. Uh, which uh, are then distributed across the network. And so, um, first of all, we don't get slowed down. If, if some of the drives are slow or they happen to be in an area where there's network congestion, um, it doesn't slow down. Uh, uh, we also end up uh, having, generally speaking, have our data much closer to the edge. So if you're in, um, if you're in Kenya and you're viewing a, a video that's sort of served from our network, chances are the data is getting served from uh, drives that are close to view rather than drives that are in Kansas. Uh, it sounds like there are some sort of cloud native uh, aspects to what you're doing. In fact, are you adopting some cloud native principles? Well, and building certainly, we build our, 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 our service uh, in, in a cloud native way. Um, but it really sort of almost takes the cloud native notion of distribution and takes it even a step further, which is that uh, things are highly decentralized. And so we built our, built our service uh, in a very particular way because we are not directly controlling the, the disk drives. So we basically use algorithms and math to make sure that we're resilient against any failure um, and, uh, and, uh, and things are done in a highly automated and scalable way so that there's really no single points of failure and there's sort of infinite scalability, which is, which is really the goal of cloud native, but we take it a step further. And blockchain is what knits this all together. Right. What tracks the location of all the of all the data? Uh, so actually, not in, not in our case. We use we use blockchain um, uh, for certain purposes, namely um, compensating the people who are running the uh, running the drives. Um, so they they do cryptographic proofs to prove that the data they have is data that they should have uh, to get compensated for running it. But then we 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 we've sort of used a large range of different kinds of peer to peer technologies um, uh, and and even frankly some. Very cool, but very old technology like erasure coding, which is on the uh, on the Voyager spacecraft, to make sure that it all knits together in a in a way that's safe, secure, private, uh, and and super fast. Are there other applications of this technology you've developed beyond storage? Uh, well, so we are working on uh, decentralized storage. Other people are out there working on decentralized compute. You know, where the application can be written and run on. Uh, 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 sorry, it can be run on uh, using CPUs that are all around the globe. Um, we happen to think storage is, is probably the most important solve, problem to solve first, um, because you know death, taxes, and data right, are things that, that, that never go away. And uh, 
and uh, the world's creating more and more data every uh, every year. It would uh, actually the data created this year would have filled a stack of CD-ROMs to the orbit of Mars and back, uh, and, <laughs> and it's going to grow from there. Uh, I love those analogies. Yeah, some of that, some of that, you know, that's cat videos, but a lot of it is really super critical data on finding, uh, you know, therapeutics for COVID or the cure for cancer or new new forms of, uh, of energy. And, and so find a way to do, to give people the, way, uh, the ability to sort of store their data in a highly secure, highly efficient and, and, very, and cost effective way, we think is really important. And what should we be looking for, for uh, from storage for the next year? Uh, well, so storage is uh, is in production. Um, we are adding uh, adding users. Um, uh, we are starting to see some larger users, which is uh, very exciting for us. Um, today, we're used primarily for sort of second tier storage, but we expect to be moving into sort of primary storage and, and even CDN down the road. Uh, it turns out that what we what we built is a really great way to distribute large files, uh, including video and 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 photos and X rays and satellite images and things like that. Well, Ben, thanks for joining us today. I know you're a CUBE alum. You've been many times on the CUBE. Sorry. I think this is the first time we've done it virtually, though. I don't know. I, uh, I, I do miss being in the same room as uh, you and your colleagues, but this is this is, uh, this is a pretty nice substitute. Yeah, so do we, believe me. Uh, ben Golub, CEO of Storage, thanks for taking time for being with us today. This has been a CUBE Conversation. I'm Paul Gillen. Thank you for joining us. Be well.